I warmly welcome you all to today's webinar on incorporating lifestyle medicine into general practice. Before we start, a few housekeeping rules. Please keep your microphones on mute, and if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box. Thank you. It is with great pleasure that I introduce our esteemed resource person today, who's joining us all the way from the Philippines. Dr. Michelle Palmer is a family medicine physician and an associate professor at the Adventist University of the Philippine College of Health and Medicine. Dr. Palmer is the president of the Philippines College of Lifestyle Medicine and the founder of the Culinary Medicine Asia. She's also one of the authors of the Lifestyle Medicine Competencies at the ACLM. As one of the pioneering certified lifestyle, med lifestyle medicine physicians, Dr. Palmer led the development of the contemporary course and specialty board examination in the Philippines. She also led the PCLM's accreditation as an affiliate specialty society of the Philippines Medical Association. So without further ado, over to you, Dr. Palmer. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank the um, Sri Lankan Society of Lifestyle Medicine and the College of General Practitioners of Sri Lanka for inviting me uh, for your webinar. Um, I am tasked to discuss about incorporating lifestyle medicine in general practice, and I just thought this is just very timely. I'm a family medicine practitioner, and seeing children, adolescents, adults, and geriatrics is one of my specialty. But we'll be dealing more on how do we actually integrate lifestyle medicine on, on our general practice and our clinical practice, and somehow is there any, any role uh, for lifestyle medicine when we bring it in the community. Um, as well. So we will have seven objectives for this um, um, lecture. So first, of course, let's define lifestyle medicine, and then we'll discuss the importance and timeliness of lifestyle medicine. Then we will review some evidence and current endorsements and guidelines for lifestyle medicine, and we will illustrate the six key interventions to treat lifestyle-related chronic conditions. And then fifth here, we'll explore uh, unique components of a lifestyle medicine practice. And then we'll describe opportunities to train and certify in lifestyle medicine. And then lastly, we'll discuss the emerging priorities of lifestyle, uh, for lifestyle medicine. I'd also like to appreciate and give credit to the uh, American College of Lifestyle Medicine uh, for the provision of uh, this material. So let's start off with the definition of lifestyle medicine so this is published by this this definition is published by the american college of lifestyle medicine and uh, it's simply defined as the use of evidence-based lifestyle therapeutic approaches um, that includes whole food plant-based eating pattern regular physical activity restorative sleep stress management avoidance of risky substances and positive social connection. And uh, please take note that this is used as a primary therapeutic modality delivered by clinicians and certified in this specialty to prevent, treat, and often reverse chronic diseases. So that means lifestyle intervention is not only for health promotion, but this is an intervention utilized for the treatment of chronic conditions. Usually the goal is remission or reversal of chronic um, conditions. So these are the six powerful interventions in lifestyle medicine that we use. And if you look at it, this six pillars of lifestyle medicine is congruent to what we are seeing right now that's causing about 80% of the total healthcare cost um, worldwide. So here, when you look at this slide, you will see that lifestyle medicine focuses on the conditions that consumes most of our healthcare budget or healthcare visits, hospitalizations, and costs. And primarily, this is because of this um, eight risky behaviors. So namely, we have poor 
um, diet intake, excessive alcohol consumption, poor standard of care, insufficient sleep, poor stress management, lack of screening, smoking, and of course, physical inactivity. And looking at the eight risk factors, you will see that most of it are lifestyle related behaviors, driving about 15 types of chronic conditions. So when you look at it and the focus of lifestyle medicine, now you will see the huge, um, the huge um, role of lifestyle intervention in primary care. I believe uh, these are the same um, conditions you see in your regular clinical practice, diabetes, coronary artery disease, hypertension, obesity, cancer, asthma, arthritis, so on and so forth. Now let's jump to our second objective. Let's just discuss uh, the importance and time of lifestyle medicine. The question is why is it really important now and why is it relevant to discuss and integrate lifestyle intervention? Maybe because lifestyle borne diseases has been growing up. It's been an epidemic already throughout the world, but the question is why it's so important now. Now, looking at this systematic analysis for the Global Burden of Disease um, study, which covers about 195 countries uh, from the year 1990 to 2017. So here, um, you will see that the uh, in the in the findings, uh, you will see here that uh, the number of deaths okay, is actually attributed mostly to dietary risk factors. So this is only dietary risk factors. And uh, looking at this uh, illustration here, you will see that the mortality uh, attributable to diet is mostly because of high sodium, uh, low, low uh, intake of whole grains, diet low in fruits, diet low in nuts and seeds. You know, these are things that we do not actually regularly discuss in our clinical um, uh, clinical, in the clinical visit with the patients and looking at this we seldom or rarely discuss you know about uh, the kinds of diseases that can be attributed to uh, regular diet so usually when the patient comes in the clinic and they'll ask what are the foods that I can eat and foods that I cannot eat uh, we usually tell them that just eat anything in moderation but uh, studies is saying the other way around that really now diet has something to do with chronic conditions. I'll give you one uh, statistics, and this is basically in the Philippines, and it's uh, literally identical to what's happening all around the globe. So the number one cause of death in our country is still ischemic disease. Number two is cerebrovascular disease. And then this is January of 2022. That's why we still have their COVID-19. And then we have neoplasm, diabetes, and hypertensive uh, diseases. So basically looking at the top 10 causes of death worldwide in my country, and I believe in, it's the same in your country, most of those are lifestyle related conditions. And so the goal of lifestyle medicine actually is into implementation of this quadruple aim. So we aim to uh, solve uh, this four um, factors using lifestyle medicine initiatives. We wanted to have better outcomes uh, and we wanted to have better patient experience, lower cost, and better clinician satisfaction. So uh, for you to see your patients getting well, getting out of their uh, maintenance medication, going back to their lives again, you know, improving and achieving remission, this is something that makes a clinician have a good satisfaction and motivation to help their patients more. Now, why lower cost? Because we are decreasing their maintenance medication, we're decreasing their risk of having another hospitalization. Let's say, for example, this is a patient uh, who had heart attack and then they were recommended into a lifestyle program, what our goal here is for them to arrest the progression of their condition and not to have another hospitalization or risk for another heart attack. So it's the same thing with diabetes. Whenever the patient uh, consults to a lifestyle medicine specialist, uh, the goal here is not only to manage their blood sugar, not only to give them the drugs that can Man, that can somehow manage their blood sugar, but our goal is maybe we can arrest the condition and if, and if it's at all possible, evidences are showing us that patients can literally achieve remission okay, of their diabetes. 
All right, so number three, uh, let's go through uh, uh, the evidences and current endorsements and guidelines for lifestyle um, medicine. So like I've said in the definition earlier, the, uh, that lifestyle medicine is evidence-based and this is guideline-driven. So every physician in the world, we all had a fair chance to look at this clinical practice guidelines. And you will see that right there on top, you know, I'll show you the slides uh, later, that lifestyle medicine has a deep root in evidences and the guidelines that we have. So science supporting uh, lifestyle medicine and it's applicable in many different disciplines. So here uh, you will see that um, lifestyle medicine is being applied in many different fields of practice. So here uh, you will see that the six domains of lifestyle medicine are actually draw from research and evidence in many different fields of science, not just uh, those keyword uh, in lifestyle medicine that you see in PubMed. You know when you when you get your when you do your research, uh, lifestyle medicine draws from the fascinating field of epigenetics, uh, from the emerging field of microbiome, as well as the field of psychology, nutrition, aging, exercise sciences, the public health. We also have the primary care, you know, for internal medicine, family medicine, pediatrics, um, obstetrics, gynecology, and of course, primary care practice, the general practice. And of course, we also work uh, with other collaboratives, um, health professionals in collaboration. Okay, so our goal here is, um, of course, to drive social determinants of health, physical health, mental health, and social um, health. Okay. Um, here, uh, lifestyle change, basically, our goal here is to make it as the first line of defense. Um, and you will see in the clinical practice guidelines, uh, both from the American College of Cardiology, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, the American Diabetes Association, uh, the American Institute for Cancer uh, Research, you will find right there the role of diet, uh, physical activity, uh, uh, in a lifestyle modification or intervention for this uh, diseases. So it's used um, as a lifestyle driven initiative or intervention for heart disease. And here, uh, actually, this is one of the early studies uh, where you can find a lifestyle group uh, uh, patients with um, heart disease who were placed as lifestyle group who had the intervention in lifestyle medicine and those who had the control group who had the conventional um, intervention. And so you will see here the difference. The lifestyle group actually had uh, a higher percentage for disease regression compared to the control group. And there is a huge decrease, you know, in cholesterol levels con compared to the control. Um, groups. So the same management is implemented and uh, actually recommended in the guidelines for diabetes here. You will see that um, lifestyle therapy is first in line uh, for the management of prediabetes. So our goal in lifestyle medicine is to reverse prediabetes. Okay? So we don't want our patients to develop full-blown diabetes. And if the patient is already uh, diabetic, when they, when they have their visit to a lifestyle medicine specialist. So the first line of treatment should be lifestyle therapy. So regardless of um, the need for medication, so let's say you're already into monotherapy or you're already giving dual therapy, triple therapy to your patients, uh, lifestyle therapy should be there. So it's a maintenance intervention. It's the initial and maintenance intervention basically for chronic conditions. So what are those lifestyle therapy? Again, like I mentioned earlier, it should include nutrition, physical activity, sleep, behavior support, and smoking cessation. So now it sounds familiar and it, it, uh, it looks like it's uh, just the general you know, recommendations that we usually give our patients, but it's really more than that. So when you learn in the competencies of lifestyle medicine, um, just in nutrition, you'll be learning more um, about it. So how do you actually 
uh, describe or prescribe a calorie-restricted diet for a patient? How do you describe a plant-based diet to a patient? We have to be aware where do we get the polyunsaturated, monounsaturated fat, and most importantly, our goal here is to actually translate these prescriptions into uh, our patient's pres our patient's practice. So we may be really good at you know prescribing lifestyle therapy, but we may not be sure whether these prescriptions are translated into their lifestyle um, into their lifestyle at home so that it can be a lifestyle intervention. All right, so here very quickly, let me illustrate this six key interventions in lifestyle medicine. Like I said, nutrition as clinical intervention is prescribed in lifestyle medicine. So we advocate uh, a predominantly whole food plant-based diet, which has um, uh, a strong evidence in terms of achieving remission or reversal, even prevention, and health promotion for chronic um, conditions. There are many um, dietary patterns out there um, that uh, emphasize uh, plant-based diet, and that's uh, the goal for uh, nutrition prescription, you know, for lifestyle related diseases. So we also have um, exercise or increasing physical activity included in the clinical intervention. To be more specific, it's about 30 minutes of uh, physical activity about five times a day. So that should be 150 to 300, to 300 minutes of moderate physical activity or 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous physical activity every week. It sounds simple, but remember that every person is different. We are very heterogeneous, so a moderate physical activity for me may be vigorous to you already, or maybe uh, a moderate physical activity to you may be, uh, can be a, a low intensity uh, physical activity for me okay so that that uh, those things we discuss you know with our patients and then there are some cases where we needed to uh, screen our patients if they uh, they can do and they can proceed with physical activity or not okay but most pro most likely physical activity or increasing mobility and decreasing sedentary behaviors is the goal in the prescription Okay, and then sleep management is also included. Uh, we understand that sleeping less than six to eight hours a night increases the risk of early death by approximately 12%. And there are so many things that we discuss in sleep management because when a patient is not achieving restorative sleep, they are uh, most likely um, affecting their dietary preferences, you know, their uh, ability to sustain their physical activity. Okay, and, and the rest of the pillars in lifestyle um, medicine. Stress management is also included in the clinical um, intervention. We know that people are all stressed. So here, chronic or maladaptive stress responses can lead to impaired health and productivity, as well as to anxiety, depression, obesity, cardiovascular disease, even irritable bowel syndrome, and um, uh, affecting immune, uh, the immune system. Okay, so of course we also include uh, addictive substance management in our, in our intervention. So this is more of um, coaching and not only clinical management. So since this is a behavior change, um, we do not only act or function as an expert, but mostly as a coach here uh, when we deal with um, uh, um, addiction, okay, uh, for suffer and addictive substance substance okay so lastly social connection is also included as a treatment uh, we believe that for a behavior change to be sustained there is to be someone who can help our patients who can be accountable you know for the changes that's happening that's why in in um, lifestyle medicine we really emphasize the involvement of the family and then involvement of uh, maybe um, someone who's taking care um, of the patient. So uh, here, there should be a connection between the provider, the coach, and the health professional, and the patient is the active ingredient of lifestyle medicine treatment. 
uh, we want the, to support the patient. So we're not only supposed to be good at prescri prescribing the patient, we have to monitor the patient and we have to help them sustain the change. Remember, there are a lot of barriers. Even if the patient is already at an action stage, they can go relapse anytime. And so uh, we're just, we're supposed to be here, you know, for support in order for them to sustain uh, those uh, new behaviors, okay? So again, uh, lifestyle change has the power to prevent disease as shown in this uh, study. I'm sure you're familiar with the diabetes prevention program. So there is about 58% reduction in the incidence of um, diabetes. Uh, in this study, and this is real-life example of lifestyle medicine. This is comparative to placebo uh, and metformin. Um, if you also check uh, the look-ahead uh, research, so this is an ancillary observational analysis of a four-year randomly controlled um, trial with over 4,500 adults uh, with BMI of over 25 and type 2 diabetes. You will see here that compared to the intensive lifestyle intervention group, um, they have, uh, uh, they experience um, more great, they, they experience greater weight loss and greater fitness level at years one and four compared to the diabetes support and education um, group. So this is another um, evidence showing you the power of lifestyle intervention for diabetes. Okay. Now let's uh, just explore the unique components of lifestyle medicine in practice. So where do you actually apply or integrate lifestyle medicine? So there are so much methods that you can, uh, you can use or strategies, you know, and they all vary. It really depends on the practitioner because even if you're in OBGYN practice, you're in pediatrics, you're in internal medicine, family medicine, surgery, or whatever specialty fields, you can actually integrate lifestyle medicine in your practice. So this is very often tailored to the patient's population and whenever there is certain insurance uh, profiles that you're trying to catch up. So there are different and uh, there are a lot of differences, you know, in lifestyle medicine practices, but most of them draw from some common sets of tools. So uh, here, usually the treatment starts with a comprehensive lifestyle behavior assessment. This can be done by a physician um, assistant or the, we have a trained nurse. Usually these nurses are also trained in lifestyle medicine and then care is delivered by lifestyle, a lifestyle medicine team. So it's composed of the physician who is the specialist in lifestyle medicine and we have a health coach as well. We have the nurse, the registered dietitian. So it's literally a collaborative team handling the patients. Okay, so we use validated assessment tools and resources. So these uh, validated tools are uh, used purposely uh, to assess patient's nutrition, uh, the patient's physical activities, their sleep, and then of course all those domains in lifestyle medicine. But these are some novel and unique uh, methods and approaches that we apply in lifestyle medicine. So we do shared medical appointments. So we do not only see patients individually because we can effectively um, empower patients and motivate patients with the same condition when we do shared medical appointments. So let's say, for example, this is a group of 20 patients with diabetes type 2, or we have another shared medical appointment for patients with hypertension or patients with, with cancer, for example. So culinary medicine is another novel me new method that we use in uh, lifestyle medicine, which is usually integrated during shared medical appointments. So this can be conducted, again, uh, as first or last part or, just the, or the, the mid part of the shared medical appointment where we demonstrate how patients can prepare their food and so that this can be easily translated at home. So remember, if you only give them the recipe, chances are they can't even implement this you know, at home. So our goal here is for our prescriptions to be translated into their practice so that it can be called a lifestyle intervention. 
Okay, so we also use digital health tools and new technology platforms for remote patient monitoring. We also use messaging platforms and applications in lifestyle intervention. So we want uh, continuous uh, monitoring to patients. Remember, we're working at behavior change and uh, this is not the conventional way of just seeing patients 10 minutes in the clinic and then after that you're done and then you just expect them to come back come back after a month. You know? So uh, we wanted remote um, patient monitoring and follow-ups. So, and of course, we critically leverage coaching, behavioral change, and positive psychology. That's why the practice is really very, very collaborative. Okay, so uh, next, let's describe the opportunities to train and certify in lifestyle medicine. So, we would say that the provider education is the foundation when you apply lifestyle medicine, since we've discussed that it's the first, it's supposed to be the first intervention for chronic conditions, which is driving 80% of the cost uh, in, our, in our healthcare system, then definitely it should be integrated in medical, basic medical education. Okay, so here, unfortunately, uh, we know that this is not only true to, in, into the United States, but I'm sure in Sri Lanka and also in our, in our country, this is also true, that the lifestyle medicine education uh, status quo is really lacking. So fortunately, there are some medical schools in, the country, in our country that's now starting to integrate lifestyle medicine competencies in, in undergraduate medical schools in the U.S. as well. It's already, it has already started. Uh, but uh, again, uh, U.S. medical schools provide average of only about 27% of the uh, uh, the minimum required 25 hours uh, recommended by the National Academy of um, Sciences. Now, looking at this, this is nutrition. So, how come nutrition education is not efficiently uh, implemented in medical education training despite the need to provide this intervention as the first line of treatment. So indeed, there is a need for a paradigm shift in medical um, education. So here uh, you will see in this study that residents even lack um, confidence and knowledge you know, to address the underlying causes of chronic uh, diseases. So that's why um, in 2010, the provider competencies for prescribing lifestyle medicine came out. And this was authored by Liana Liano and Mark Johnson. And it was actually updated in 2022. So now we have about 88 competencies, you know, core competencies in lifestyle medicine. So definitely education in lifestyle medicine is imperative. And that's why here comes uh, the recent 2019 resolution that was released by the American Medical Association to support policies and provide funding for lifestyle medicine education at all levels of medical education. Uh, in our country, this is what we're working at with, American, with the Philippine Medical Association as well. So now in the U.S., uh, lifestyle medicine is already implemented in many different um, educational platform, including public health, general preventive medicine, residency programs, internal medicine, family medicine, preventive medicine, and other sites. Now, uh, in our country, right now in the Philippines, we are integrating lifestyle medicine in undergraduate medical education in some medical schools. Uh, we also have the existing public health education. So this is master's degree in public health majoring in lifestyle medicine. Uh, we also have lifestyle medicine continuing medical education. And right now we already have this uh, specialty certification, board certification in lifestyle medicine uh, in the Philippines. So lifestyle medicine is already considered a specialty practice in the country. And uh, beginning 2024, the subspecialty certification, so this is a clinical fellowship training already in, in preventive and lifestyle medicine, uh, it will be launched in 2024 with, in three pilot hospitals in the country. So definitely there is uh, an exponential growth in lifestyle medicine education all over um, the globe. It's not only happening in, in Asia, but it's also happening in, in other developed countries. 
And so in continuing medical education, we do not only target physicians because this is a collaborative um, healthcare. We cannot efficiently function alone. You know, we need our health coaches. We need our, our registered uh, nutritionists and dietitians. We need our nurses, you know, to be trained in this field. And uh, we also need our physician assistants, you know, to be trained in this field because, uh, you know, when we talk about behavior change, this is literally a program that you offer your patients. Say, this is a four-week program and that needs more monitoring and follow-ups, you know, you can't do it alone. That's why we have the help from our collaborative team and we also do the digital um, aspect of medical practice. Okay. All right, so lastly, let's discuss the emerging priorities um, in lifestyle medicine here. Uh, you can see that there is really a need for this new approach and new foundation. Now to scale lifestyle medicine, we need a system approach and a new foundation of healthcare rather than sick care. We need to be proactive rather than being just only reactive. The implementation of lifestyle medicine as cure necessitates personalized and sustained lifestyle adoptions, which can only be established by a systems approach. So the introduction of such a system approach, for example, in diabetes type 2 therapies, uh, therapy not only requires a, concert, a concerted action of many stakeholders, but also a change in healthcare economy with new winners and losers. So looking at this, um, this is the emerging priority for lifestyle medicine. We want it to be uh, integrated into population health frameworks, branching into communities and community-based organizations, uh, utilizing lifestyle medicine to address uh, health disparities, uh, developing frameworks for successful lifestyle medicine practice linked to, to reimbursement, and I, th and I think that's really important uh, for, for the interventions to be sustainable and to give equal opportunities you know, for patients to have lifestyle um, intervention. And of course, deepening educational opportunities and developing partnerships to scale the impact back of lifestyle medicine. So this is just an example of community-based lifestyle medicine practice. So we do not limit our practice in the four corners of our clinics or in the hospitals, but we have community-based practice as well. So we reach out to people, uh, you know, who may be in, the re in remote places where healthcare um, services are not really available. And so we reach out. To them. Okay, so here, this is how uh, we can we bring them. We bring patients to health food shops. You know, teaching them during during our, our lifestyle program. Say this is a group of 20 people, 15 or, or 10 people in your program, and so uh, we let them visit local gardens. You know, as for for their source of their of the produce that they need to prepare at home you know, and then shops, and then we do shared medical appointment using video presentations, so on and so forth. Now, we also have advocacies implemented with the government agencies collaborative, collaboratively, and uh, we also implement this school-based lifestyle medicine practice. We really believe that enculturation should be implemented among children. So that's why now we are... Um, in an active campaign, you know, in implementing lifestyle medicine um, competencies for teens, you know, and the materials are freely provided by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, thanks to the current president right now, Dr. Beth Freitas, and uh, they actually provided these resources for us, um, lifestyle medicine societies, you know, to use that material so that we can, it can help us in our campaign in implementing lifestyle medicine uh, interventions or health promotion, you know, in, in producing and instating uh, healthy um, learning institutions. So we believe that enculturation in this, uh, in this age group is really necessary, you know, for, uh, for, our pop, for, for the general public to increase their health literacy, okay? 
So we also uh, integrate gardening to children, and this is integrated in the uh, in the in the school. You know how will we even teach children to eat vegetables when they do not appreciate how it's grown? So, you know when we realized when the kids are really involved in, from the from the planting of the of the uh, of the produce, you know, and then harvesting and then preparation, you know, they would appreciate and they will really try tasting it and they will uh, actually enjoy. So this pilot program uh, uh, has proven that uh, these interventions are actually working. Okay, so again, we have this lifestyle medicine collaborative of team model where the lifestyle medicine specialist, you can be, a lifestyle medicine specialist can be a general practitioner, can be a, any, any fields, medical field special, uh, specialist, or you can be a cardiologist, you can be a pulmonologist, you know, and uh, if you wanted to integrate lifestyle medicine in your practice, then that's really good, and that will give you a market differentiation. How are you different from other pulmonologists? How are you different from other cardiologists, right? Um, but we work with, in a collaborative care model. So we refer patients to specialists whenever it's needed. Specialists would refer patients um, to us. Say, for example, this is a patient, an obese patient with increased liver enzymes with lots of maintenance medications already, and the, patients, uh, the patient is not opting for additional medication, then these patients are uh, usually referred for a lifestyle medicine program. Of course, we collaborate with the uh, um, the primary physician or the general practitioner, if there is a need to taper medications, de-prescribe medication or de-escalate medications. So a lifestyle medicine uh, practitioner uh, can practice in diff many different settings. So we have outpatient primary care, of course, this is what we do in general practice. Um, we can, you can do a clinical practice in lifestyle medicine emphasizing shared medical appointments or group visits. There's also concierge practices or um, what we call this, um, uh, this is what we call corporate uh, lifestyle medicine practice, or there's, there can be a residential uh, lifestyle medicine practice as well. And of course, we have telemedicine. So these are just examples of um, um, lifestyle medicine interventions that's already applied in, uh, in the hospitals, so namely this is the NYC uh, Health and Hospital, so they, they literally have a very strong foundation in implementing lifestyle medicine programs, you know, in New York uh, City um, hospitals. So now this is in UL, UCLA, they have the uh, Health or Lifestyle Medicine Program, the Cleveland Clinic, they have their lifestyle medicine program as well in the Philippines we have hospitals uh, that are piloting lifestyle medicine um, centers and uh, services offering services in the hospital uh, and here this is uh, another hospital in the Philippines and another hospital in the Philippines so these hospitals are actually hiring lifestyle medicine specialists you know to operate their lifestyle centers Okay, so this is just one of the uh, example of what we do uh, in our country. So this is a lifestyle medicine interface, and this is part of the, the digital lifestyle medicine practice we have. And this is a portal that's providing, um, uh, what do you call this, a portal providing our patients and our, our providers for remote monitoring. Uh, purposes and of course the provision of lifestyle intervention. Okay. All right, so in summary, we're able to uh, uh, identify um, some of the items why we can say that lifestyle medicine should be included in primary health care, and that means in general practice. So we defined lifestyle medicine. We discussed the importance and timeliness of lifestyle medicine. We also reviewed evidence and current endorsements and guidelines for lifestyle medicine. We also illustrated six key interventions to treat uh, lifestyle-related chronic conditions. And then we explored unique components of a lifestyle medicine practice. We also described opportunities to train and certify in lifestyle medicine. And lastly, we also discussed the emerging priorities for lifestyle medicine. So I think um, 
you already uh, see how important uh, that how important it is to have somehow you know lifestyle medicine competencies in general practice because again uh, this lifestyle related diseases are the ones we see in our clinics 80% of the time and it's eating up our healthcare system budget uh, so thank you so much everyone for giving your attention and a good evening Thank you so much, Dr. Palmer, for joining us all the way from the Philippines. I know it's quite late for you at the moment. Uh, before we go into the question and answer session, the president of the Sri Lanka Lifestyle Society, uh, Dr. Samandika Saparamadu, would like to uh, speak a few words. Over to you, uh, Samandika. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Dinesh Shani. I really appreciate the opportunity given to me. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Michelle, for the wonderful presentation. I would not talk, take too much time, uh, just a minute, just to remind everyone that the International Board of Lifestyle Medicine Examination is taking place in Sri Lanka this year on the 7th of October at the Kalama Medical School. So if anyone is interested in uh, being certified as a lifestyle medicine practitioner, either at, at a capacity of a doctor or a professional, please reach out to us, either through our the Facebook page or else you can write to us uh, you can email us at info at slslm.org.lk. So I think that's all I want to tell. Uh, don't want to take up any more time. Let's straight away go to the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Dr. Dinesh. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Samandika. Uh, so there were a few questions. One is, uh, do you recommend a ketogenic diet? And your thoughts on intermittent fasting, whether it's good or bad, uh, Dr. Palmer? Hi, um, can you hear me well? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. That's actually a very good question, and that's a common question we always hear whenever we talk about nutrition. Uh, we have really good evidences and sound evidences showing us that intermittent fasting can be really beneficial, and it would really depend on how you do this and for which condition you are doing this. So like, for example, if you're doing this for diabetes, uh, yes, you know, we, there's so much evidence just to tell us that fasting can really help this individuals with diabetes. Um, we just have to make sure that uh, anyone who's doing intermittent fasting will, never, will not go for binge eating, you know. At the end of the day, uh, we always uh, go through how much of the calorie you actually consume for the day and how much calorie um, you spent for the day. So like, for example, you've been into intermittent fasting and then you look forward for the heaviest meal right after. And so you basically consume the same number of calories or sometimes even more. So yes, we have good evidences for um, intermittent fasting. We just have to be careful with binge eating. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts on the ketogenic diet? <laughs> okay. So that's actually very controversial. But uh, um, even if we see some ev some evidences that there is a short term benefit for um, using ketogenic diets, say for example for weight loss or for patients with diabetes, unfortunately when we look at long term evidences, it only shows um, potential uh, increase in mortality, potential increase in inflammation and increase in LDL cholesterol and so on and so forth. And that's why even if we review the uh, current uh, guideline of the AHA, yes, they recognize uh, some of the short-term benefit of ketogenic diet. However, just because um, what we want uh, a person's diet to be is not just for weight loss, but it should be heart healthy diet. So we're not only concerned about losing those excessive adiposity, but we wanted to somehow introduce um, all the nutrients that we need, you know, that the body needs to the patient. And we know that in ketogenic diet, they're actually restricting a lot of nutrients because most of this nutrients are found um, uh, on whole foods that are high in, uh, high in carbohydrates, high in fiber, high in micronutrients at the same time. Even with the latest um, statement that you get from the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, and um, many other um, societies, uh, they would recognize uh, the short-term effect of ketogenic diet. However, they still 
um, recommend the reintroduction of carbohydrates and just letting go of the refined carbohydrates. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions? Uh, Dr. Pab, I would like to ask what a usual lifestyle medicine clinic would look like. Uh, do you have the classes with the community going on as well as uh, the other interventions that you spoke about? It really depends on how you wanted to integrate lifestyle medicine in your practice. Uh, it can be as simple as integrating lifestyle medicine in your regular clinic, like this is a general practice clinic, and then you start uh, providing counseling to patients. But again, this is not just the 10 minute um, you know, clinic visit with a patient. So because you'll never be able to counsel a patient when you do this only for two, for 10 minutes, but you can, we can already do um, lifestyle assessment uh, with a very short period of time. And that's where tools in lifestyle assessment uh, is will be very useful. Um, but you can also create, or maybe you can plan to have a lifestyle center. So it can, be, and lifestyle centers can be small and they, they can be big. You know, it really depends on how you want this uh, to be. Like I have presented earlier, you can have shared medical appointment. Of course, if this is shared medical appointment, then maybe you should at least, you know, accommodate 10 people at the same time. And this is where uh, lifestyle medicine is really, really um, efficient in providing health education, counseling, and sustaining patients' health behavior change. Because like we meet patients, these are all diabetic patients. And this is where we explain um, why do they need to change a specific behavior, you know? And that's where you talk about the physiology that's going on. And that's where you talk about some other interventions, whether the patient's goal is into remission or just manage his condition, or maybe the goal is to arrest the progression of the disease or maybe arrest um, the potential complications. And this is where we efficiently do it during shared medical appointment, because just imagine yourself seeing diabetic patients like 20 in, the role, in a row, and then how can you be able to counsel the patient and repeating things Every time you see the same the same case, right? You may be good at explaining this and counseling patients in the first two or three, but on the fourth and in the fifth, I'm not really sure if you're going to be really uh, sharing the same thing, like even fifty percent. But in shared medical appointment, that's the best venue when we can have this educational um, sessions with patients, you know, and they can have group support as well. But there are also setups where you can create a lifestyle center where you can um, accommodate patients, you know, who can stay for like 11 days or 12 days during the program or even more than that. You know, I I, I have, I had um, immersion trainings uh, in lifestyle centers and the longest patient, you know, that would stay in the lifestyle center is about six months. You know, so there are different settings in a lifestyle center. It really depends on the program that you offer. Okay, uh, th thank you very much. There's another question regarding, uh, are there any international lifestyle medicine organizing? Sorry, uh, before that, uh, do you have any specific business models used for lifestyle medicine clinics in the Philippines? Uh, is there any government supported programs? Okay, so as of the moment, because the Philippines is uh, in the transition uh, in the, the, uh, in adopting the universal health care, uh, we are more on health promotion this time. And then the Philippines is into uh, the in instituting uh, primary care facilities where health promotion, health education, and lifestyle modification are the forefront. So as to how it could be reimbursed, that's where um, local evidences should come in. And since the Philippine College of Lifestyle Medicine was just born in 2015, uh, and it was just officially, um, what do you call this, um, registered and had our accreditation just the past um, couple of years. And so we're really trying to gain and um, you know gather local evidences so that somehow we can justify that this lifestyle programs we offer um, locally 
should be reimbursed, but there are basic um, coverage already, you know, in lifestyle intervention. Just like in the United States, there are basic um, lifestyle medicine services that would be reimbursed. It may not be the entire program that will be reimbursed, but there are lifestyle programs like the Orange program, it's totally reimbursed for the Medicare. So it really depends, I, I would say, country for country. But in the Philippines, yes, we already have this, this um, practice model on lifestyle intervention. Since we are, uh, we are already a specialty society in the country, we are already recognized with the Philippine Medical Association. And uh, doctors recognize that lifestyle intervention should be the first line of um, treatment in this chronic um, conditions. And so patients are referred to us and that's how it goes, you know, the referral system. But with regards to the reimbursement, you know, that's a work in progress. Okay. Uh, I think this is the final question. Are there any international lifestyle medicine organizations that Sri Lankan primary care doctors can get involved in for learning and knowledge sharing? Yeah, so uh, as of the moment, it's the International Board of Lifestyle Medicine that's offering the certification uh, program for anyone who's interested to go into lifestyle medicine um, practice. So the International Board of Lifestyle Medicine actually provides the foundational certification for lifestyle medicine practitioners. And um, the training programs uh, are being, or the training course is being offered by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. So you get the course from the American, Bo American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and then it's the International Board of Lifestyle Medicine that provides the certification. Um, and there's another certification in lifestyle medicine, which is called the intensivist certification. So like I've said, you go for the foundational certification first, and then as you move along, as you practice, you know, uh, you can actually... Uh, you can actually have more uh, experience and um, have more um, competency so that you can fulfill the intensivist category of certification. So it's the International Board of Lifestyle Medicine and like the Sri Lankan um, Society of Lifestyle Medicine, the Philippine College of Lifestyle Medicine and other um, uh, lifestyle medicine societies under the American, Council, American Lifestyle Medicine Council were all under the Lifestyle Medicine Global Alliance. So, um, but in the Philippines, we just have our independent um, board examination here, just because we have an existing um, recognized um, practice already and that we are required to have our local uh, certification standards. So I believe that's also the direction in Sri Lanka as you go along. Um, but as of the moment, uh, it's the I International Board of Lifestyle Medicine or IBLM that provides certification programs for lifestyle medicine practitioners. Okay, thank you so much. I think that's the end of uh, the questions. And thank you so much for joining us today. It was a very informative lecture. I think we gained a lot of knowledge today. Thank you, Dr. Palmer, for joining. Thank you Good. for having me. Good night, everyone. Good night.